Well, hey, hey, good morning, everyone. It's Chris Wilson with Torah and Messiah YouTube channel. And uh, if you hear any background noise today, such as birds or the occasional car driving by, it's because I'm out in my open door office called uh, Outside the Nature. <laughs> so bear with me. And uh, today we're going to be bringing you uh, by Brad Scott, Let This Mind Be in You, an historical study of the differences between Greek and Hebrew thought. Um, I just love this book, and I think it's an excellent tool to give, especially people that come out of the Christian church or any nominal religion of uh, any type of mainstream uh, Christian background, whether it be Catholic, Presbyterian, Pentecostal, things of that such. To have a, uh, an understanding of the Eastern and Western mindset and thought processes in terms of interpreting the scripture, because we shouldn't look at the scripture through a Christian lens or a Judaistic lens, but we should only look at them through the men who wrote that, and that was Hebrews. And then how does that then apply to us where we live today? Whether that's Germany, Australia, United States, doesn't matter. What does matter is how, if we want to partake in the covenant with Yah, the Almighty, then we must understand how His Word applied to not only His people that He chose, but to the stranger who wants to serve in with the body. And that's kind of what we'll be looking at whenever I pick back up from the principle of the seed, chapter 8. And uh, right now we're going to look at chapter 2 of Let This Mind Be In You, and this is The Influence of Homer. There's a lot of great books out there that talk about the influence on the Christian church of the first century, whether it's from uh, different schools of thought, being the Alexandrian schools, these uh, philosophers such as Plato, Homer, Aristotle, Socrates, and so we're going to get into that a little bit here, and uh, I hope you enjoy this, because I certainly do, especially whenever we look at how that plays a role in the context of the scripture, and how that kind of shaped and formed the ideology moving past uh, the first century writers of what we call the New Testament today. So let us begin. Chapter 2, The Influence of Homer. The New Testament makes several references to Grecians and to what had become commonly known as Hellenism. What is Hellenism and what influence did Hellenism have on the culture of Yeshua's time? The term Hellenistic was coined in the 19th century and was used to designate the period of Greek and Near Eastern history from the death of Alexander the Great in 323 BC to the death of Cleopatra the Seventh, the last Macedonian ruler of Egypt in 30 BC. The early Hellenistic period saw the emergence of a new form of relationship compounded from Macedonian and Near Eastern traditions, which became the dominant political, religious, and social structure in the Eastern Mediterranean after Alexander's death. The quote, Helen of Hellenism, comes from the writings of a blind poet by the name of Homer. Most Greek scholars are not convinced that this man actually lived, but for someone who may not have existed, he was certainly very influential in the social justice. His alleged writings were called the Iliad and the Odyssey. These were epics set in the 12th century BC about a war between Greece and the city of Troy. This is where the Trojans come from. This is not a book on Greek history, but we need to understand the background from which Greek thinking comes. It did not burst onto the scene with Alexander. There was a gradual process that springboarded the influence of Greek thinking onto the known world at that time and virtually every Gentile that Shaul or the Apostle Paul came into contact with. As a matter of fact, the Greek stories of the first century AD had the Hebrew conquests of Canaan already morphing into the story of the Iliad and the wanderings in the wilderness transferred to the Odyssey. The retrospective story of the Trojan War that the Iliad tells symbolizes the aims of this society 
as reflected in the literature of a later age. The heroes of Homer's poems sail far from their homes in Greece to attack the citadel of the Trojans in western Anatolia. Their announced mission is to rescue Helen, the Greek queen, whom the son of the king of Troy had lured away from her husband. This is essentially where the term Hellenism comes from. Most of the anti-biblical pagan cultures we are familiar with, Greek, Babylonian, Persian, etc., have a woman or goddess type mother that represents that culture. Isis, Astarte, Ishtar, and Gaia are some examples. Greek culture was no different. However, this way of thinking has a background as well. The background of Hellenism is from Egypt, no less. Some 19th century scholars wish to downplay or deny any significant cultural influence of the Near East on Greece, but that was plainly not the ancient Greek view of the question. Greek intellectuals of the historical period claimed that Greeks owed a great deal to the older civilization of Egypt, in particular to religion and art. Recent research agrees with this ancient opinion. Greek sculptors in the Archaic Age chiseled their statues according to a set of proportions established by Egyptian artists. Greek mythology, the stories that Greeks told among themselves about their deepest origins and their relations to the gods, was infused with stories and motifs of Near Eastern origin. The clearest evidence of the deep influence of Egyptian culture on Greek culture is the store of seminal religious ideas that flowed from Egypt to Greece. Rather than looking for a non-existent origin of Greek identity, we will identify as much as possible the various sources of cultural influence that flowed together over a long period of time to produce the Greek culture we find recorded in the times of the New Testament. The term Hellenism conveys the idea that a mixed cosmopolitan form of social and cultural life combining Hellenic, that is Greek, traditions with indigenous traditions emerged in the eastern Mediterranean region during the aftermath of Alexander's conquests. This provides some of the background for the term Grecian or Hellenist as applied to many Jews at the time of Yeshua. These represented a mixture of Hebrew ethnicity and Greek worldviews. The anglicized terms Greek or Grecian appear only once in the Tanakh, or the Old Testament. Joel chapter 3 verse 6, quote, The children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have you sold unto the Grecians that you might remove them far from their border, end quote. Its root meaning, however, appears two more times in the Psalms. The Hebrew word of this word is Yavaneh, which means mire or mud. Psalm 40 verse 2, He brought me up also out of the horrible pit and out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my goings. Psalm 69.2 I sink in deep mire, where there is no standing. I am come into deep waters, where the floods overflow me. Its two root uses in the Tanakh, or the Old Testament, appear to be referring to circumstances of deliverance, which is in perfect harmony with its theological use of scripture as well. The New Testament appearance of the word Greek or Grecian is actually taken from the Greek word Hellenistes. There is no New Testament appearance of the word Greek in the Greek version. The ways of the nations in scripture represents a mixture of various ideas and views on how to live life. The Greek pers perspective provides us with a background as to the nature of a god or gods who desire to be worshipped, entertained, adored, and revered, but not necessarily obeyed. In Greek mythology, the gods were to be revered and celebrated, but the intellect was to guide man in this life. This is precisely why Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians that the Jews require a sign, but the Greek seeks wisdom. 1 Corinthians 1.22, quote, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom, end quote. The Greeks are also known for their philosophy. We will discuss Aristotle and others later. The poems of the poet Homer set the stage for the creative writing of the Greek myths of ancient gods and goddesses. This would provide the background for the ultimate mind of all the gods called the Logos. This Logos, manifested in Greek mythology as Zeus, as we will learn later, is a mixture of religious concepts drawn from several cultural sources. These are generally represented scripturally by Jezebel, Babylon, the Queen of Heaven, and many other names which we will mention as we go. The nature or essence of Greek philosophy will be studied in detail later. 
Right now, our focus is to establish the fact that this philosophy made a major impact on the thinking process of the populations which Paul encountered and that this influence has stayed with the church, notice quote church is what I said there, for the 2,000 years. The following is a quote from the book Alexander the Great by N.G.L. Hammond. Mr. Hammond is considered to be the foremost expert on ancient Macedonian history. Macedonia is the ancient name of the kingdom of the Balkan Peninsula, which generally covers the area of Greece, Yugoslavia, and Bulgaria. Quote, In 342 BC, Philip, who is Alexander's father, hired Aristotle at a handsome salary to teach philosophy, which embraced both practical and theoretical knowledge. Lessons and seminars were held usually in the open air in the sanctuary of the nymphs near Mesa, a beautiful place with natural grottoes in the limestone, which was visited by sightseers in Plutarch's day and still is so visited. The influence of Aristotle on Alexander was profound. Alexander accepted as correct Aristotle's views on cosmology, geography, botany, zoology, and medicine, and therefore took scientists with his army to Asia, and he was fascinated by Aristotle's lectures on logic, metaphysics, the nature of poetry, and the essence of politics. Above all, he learned from Aristotle to put faith in the intellect. In their personal relationship, the boys' admiration developed into a deep affection, and they shared a special interest in establishing the text of the Iliad." End quote. Homer was the major influence on Aristotle. It was Homer who introduced, at least from the view of literature, the whole idea of mythology and hero worship. This lies at the core of Greek society. The era called the Dark Age of Greece from 900 to 700 BC was the beginning of the construction of gymnasiums. These were Greek arenas that housed athletic games with great crowds cheering the participants and the gods, particularly Zeus. The gymnasium was a place where nude athletes would appease the gods by their great feats. The word gymnos in the Greek word the word gymnos is the Greek word for naked. This period also began the great city-state called the polis, where we get the word metropolis which was designed to confine the social elite. These cities were erected to honor the gods. Within these city-states, smaller arenas, later called theaters, were erected. Theaters began with the Greeks and were intended to host two particular events. At the beginning, they were primarily used to provide a place for the pop uh, production of comedies and later Greek tragedies. But by the later Archaic Age, these were used to host the great philosophers in their famous debates. These debates were originally created to provide a place for the great thinkers and intellects to have a place to out-intellectualize each other. These places would soon produce Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. All right, folks, well, there you have it. That was chapter two, uh, the influence of Homer. Chapter three is the Athenian history, and that's more we get more into Socrates and Plato uh, and so forth with their ideology and influence onto some of the thinkers uh, that Paul went up against whenever he was trying to spread the gospel to these other cultures. And uh, I hope you enjoyed that, and I hope you're having a great day to start off. And may you have a blessed one, and Yahweh keep you and watch over you, and may he give you his shalom. In the meantime, my friends, be a doer of the word, test everything, and I appreciate you listening. If you like it, please leave a comment and share. Take care and Yahweh bless. Oh, we put your hope in Yahweh, who makes wars to see.